Hi, Jana. Hi, Frank. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, as always. Even though I wish we were seeing each other uh, and to talk about something else than the genocide or the genocides with an S now. Um, we've been talking quite a few times over the last 12 months. Um, and here we are talking again, 12 months later, the genocide in Gaza still going on. Uh, now there is a an offensive in Lebanon that looks like could be a repeat of what's happening in Gaza. But I wanted to ask you, have we learned anything in the last year? Yes, we have. Um, let's start with the bad and then move to the good. The bad is that we've learned that the West really hates us. And they're willing to see our children be mangled, to hear our kids screaming, to see journalists after journalists gunned down. Um, they're willing to see whole cities flattened, 80% of buildings destroyed, entire agricultural systems completely destroyed. They're willing to see hospitals attacked, schools attacked, shelters attacked. Um, humanitarian aid workers attacked, UN workers attacked. They're willing to see it all and not willing to do anything. And so that's one thing that I've definitely learned over the past year. The second thing I've learned is that as much as people say there are these international institutions, and I'm somebody who does believe in these, that um, these institutions are terribly slow at actually doing anything to prevent or stop genocide. Instead, it's, um, as I've always known, but, but this has been such an eye-opener of just how much it's infused with power, which isn't, again, isn't to say to, that we have to give up on them, but just the fact that we see how um, these institutions have done nothing for us. And, I, and I'm, I'm talking about, or very little, I'm talking about things like the UN, like um, like the International Court of Justice, which has come out with great decisions but have yet to be implemented, like uh, the International Criminal Court. And so we've, we've definitely learned that. On the plus side of things is that I've seen probably more love in this past year than I've seen in, in uh, love for Palestine than I've seen in my lifetime. And we've seen that people are willing to put their their um, their careers on the line, themselves on the line, their education on the line, because they believe and very strongly believe that they don't want to be part of this machinery, this killing machinery. Um, and so the love that I've seen over the course of the past year, I think, knows no bounds, knows no limits, and that has been. I think for the vast majority of Palestinians, the one thing that has sustained us all of this time. Thanks, Diana. Have we, um, did you, have we learned anything about Zionism? Nothing that I didn't know before. <laughs> you know, look, Zionism is, um, is a system, it's an ideology of supremacy, of superiority. And the only way that the Nakba could have been carried out, which is, you know, the implementation of Zionism, was through the dehumanization of Palestinians. That there, there's no other way that you can take over the country of another people, the land of another people, literally the homes of another people, including their furniture and their, their everything that's inside of the house, without uh, dehumanization. And um, and so if anything that people should be taking away from this is as much as people try to claim that there are different shades of Zionism, different types of Zionism, we, the Palestinians, are the ones who know what Zionism is about. And we've we've experienced it on our bodies. And so people should be asking us what Zionism is about, um, not trying to come up with you know, philosophical definitions of it. Have we learned anything 
No, I certainly haven't. I knew that it was about supremacy. I knew that it was about dehumanization of Palestinians. And what we've seen this past year is just the manifestation of it. That's all. I want to talk about the US. Yeah. Have we learned anything about the US? Because I'm kind of troubled by this question. Like a lot of people say Israel is the US sort of police police person in, in, in you know in the middle of the the Arab world and the oil, etc. So the US has, uh, you know, gives it a lot of money and has a lot of, of say in what Israel does. It would seem in the last few months that actually the US doesn't have much of a say despite financing really Israel's genocide. But then I'm wondering, is it real? If you know what I mean, like, or is the US, despite the words of ceasefire, we're working very hard on it, actually is quite happy with what's happening. It's very happy with what's happening. Look, I, I think it's a, a bit of both. The, the Israel is the colonial outpost for the United States. I mean, that's, that, that's plainly obvious at this point. Um, why is it plainly obvious? By the fact that it gets this this diplomatic support, the fact that it gets financial support, the fact that it gets military support, the fact that we see legislation in the United States that says that, that there should be no um, no country that has more weapons than Israel. Right? This is actual law in the United States. And so this is, and there's a relationship between the arms industry in the United States and the arms industry in Israel. And there's, there's a, they work, they feed off of one another. So the U.S. is definitely calling the big picture shots. I think over the course of the past year, um, Biden is a president who, you know, I, I think is I think he's suffering from some type of dementia. And and so in part, I think that what he what he did was he subcontracted his 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 role to the monster that is called um and Israel and and to and specifically to Netanyahu the the prime minister and and so i think that on you know there's a debate that's always going on inside Israel of who's calling the shots is it Israel who's calling the shots is it the united states who's calling the shots on the big picture it's definitely the united states and and i don't think we should be fooled by that um uh because this is in their interest to continue this in many ways if if their interest is to maintain a colonial foothold in the Arab Middle East. On the other hand, on the day to day, I think that's very much being called by Israel. The type of weaponry that's being used, the the scale of the attacks, um, you name it, is is definitely being called by Israel. And and you see this tension play itself out, particularly when Netanyahu went to Congress. He, you know, went to Congress and he and he he kind of gave the finger to Biden, saying, "You told me not to go to Rafah, and I I did it anyway." You know, so that's what Israel's about. It's a it's about. Um, on the one hand, they know that they wouldn't be able to survive without Israel, without uh, U.S. support and U.S. weaponry, and on the other hand, they've been given the the ability to call the shots on the ground and to do things to to tactically implement things in the way um, that, that they see fit with the big picture obviously coming from, from the United States. Look, if the U.S. wanted to end this, it could have. It could have ended this within the first three weeks. There was an attempt to call a ceasefire within the first three weeks, and the U.S. vetoed it. Um, then there was other attempts to call a ceasefire. The, the, the U.S. also vetoed it. And, uh, and so it's clear that that the U.S. has the ability. It's just choosing not to at this point. Yeah, because in a way, like obviously, in life and in politics, actions speak a lot louder than, than words. Absolutely. I mean, only in the last few weeks, we've heard the U.S. tell Israel and Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis and Iran, please, no escalation. De-escalation is, is the word. Yeah. While Israel, while Israel attacks. Yes. yes. Then Israel kills Haniyeh, which yes. is like such massive escalation. Yeah. The next day, the US is like, please, please, no escalation. No escalation. Yes. Israel kills Nasrallah. Yeah. Which is 
I think, the biggest escalation you could have. And then the U.S. says, you know, no escalation. Israel actually invades Lebanon and starts bombing Lebanon with 2,000 pounds bombs. And now the U.S. is saying, actually, we're going to use Israel's invasion of Lebanon to get rid of Hezbollah. So you're thinking all this way, you've told us no escalation, but now you're saying, oh, actually, we're pretty happy with this. Uh, Escalation only works in one direction. That's the problem, is that whatever Israel does is not considered escalation. Um, It's only escalation when when any other person responds to Israel's criminal actions. That's when it's suddenly an escalation. And that's when you hear the refrain of no escalation, no escalation. This is the problem, you know, Frank, is that Israel has been given a um, carte blanche, right? They've been given this blank check to do whatever it is that they want to do. And it's not just about Israel as a country. But I want you to think about what this means for a society. And, and what it means for the society is, is something that I feel on, on every, each and every day. This isn't just about them being bombing and, get, and getting away with it and, people, and them killing people, which is, of course, the ultimate and, and, um, and, and the most of, of like the levels of dehumanization that you can just bomb entire neighborhoods and somehow call them a collateral damage. But also on the societal level, you have people who are walking around here who think that that they were absolutely right to carry out a genocide um, over the course of the past year and that the world is standing by them. In other words, with the message that Israelis are receiving is not that that um, that they should stop or that they have done anything wrong. It's that these these international institutions are against them and that the world is with them and that they're actually doing the world a favor. The talk today, um, Frank, is, is very interesting. You hear it in the papers, on the, on the streets and, and on the newscast, where they're openly talking about regime change in Iran. They're using those exact words, regime change in Iran. And the way that they couch it is the same way that the United States couched regime change in Iraq, the same way they couched regime change in Afghanistan, is that it's better for the population. They're not talking, they're saying that like they're kind of doing Iran a favor if they get rid of this uh, of of this um, Iranian government. And and so that's their way of of viewing things is that they've been on a societal level, been been allowed to feel that that they can do whatever they want and that their TikToks their, their, um, you know, their dances, their wearing women's lingerie, the steel looting Palestinian houses, the blowing up Palestinian houses and dedicating it to their children, blowing up universities, mosques, uh, bombing churches, hospitals, that all of that is justified. And that's the part that's terrifying is that it's the, a mindset that has been created. Now in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, um, Germans went through a, a massive program of re-education, of, of getting them to understand what Nazism was and, and, the, and how bad it was. In the case of Israel, and they also learned about genocide. In the case of Israel, all that they're learning is how good genocide is and the benefits to genocide. And hey, you can build up a, a, a social media presence um, it gives you good TikTok views and uh, and you'll get called on to be a star on the local media and that there are no, no repercussions. That's the terrifying part of all of this is that it's going to continue and continue and continue because this mindset has been created. How much do you think all this has to do with anti-Palestinian racism? Tons. Tons. Look, the, the, as, I, as I earlier said, the, the only way that they could have carried out the Nakba was through the dehumanization of Palestinians. There, there's no other way that you can do that. I mean, I, I look around and think, how is it that you're living in a Palestinian home unless you think that that Palestinian was not human enough and not worthy enough to live in the, the home that they actually built with their own hands? Um, and, and so that's been... That's what's fueled Israel all of these years. What's fueled the lack of pressure on on Israel 
is anti-Palestinian racism in, in part, but it's also an idea that um, that this is a colonial project. And in this colonial project, they want to make it work and they're going to fund it, support it diplomatically, do whatever. Look, one of the things that I found the most fascinating is just how each and every world leader has fallen in line and used the same talking points in relation to October the 7th on the on the one year um, date, on the one year mark, where they were using the exact same words of of um, the, what was it, largest number of, of, uh, of Jews killed since the Holocaust. And the fast in, in one day, and the fascinating thing about that is that it, it lumps it all into anti-Semitism and completely depoliticizes and removes any context of what Israel has done. And, and yet I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's as though for them, that, that nothing that Israel did for all of these years, for the decades, for 76 years, nothing that they did justifies October the 7th. That's the way the, the thinking is. And yet October the 7th justifies everything that Israel has done since, including genocide. That's such perverse thinking. And the only way that you can buy into that is through the dehumanization of Palestinians and having this a deep, 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 deep hatred for, for us. I don't know if you saw Obama's statement, yes, I did. which was <laughs> terrible on so many levels, but, but in a way, mainly because he didn't mention hardly the Palestinians and the you know, 40,000 plus death, but also because he used numbers and facts that even the Israeli don't use anymore. Correct. He talked about 1,400 Israeli civilians de dead on October the 7th, when even Israel says it's like less than 1,200, yes. including about 380 soldiers. So mm -hmm. the fact that he would use numbers that no one uses anymore Is, is telling that, and I think he probably knows, I mean, he's got to know they're not the right numbers, but it's all about, yeah, propaganda. And what's been interesting in the, you know, the October the 7th sort of anniversary from heads of states, and I was talking to Eyal Sivan about this yesterday, it's that they, a few have said, including Macron in France, you know, ceasefire should come. Maybe we should stop sending weapons to a country that bombs schools, mosques and universities. But all this is framed under unconditional support for Israel. And they keep repeating this. So if you, it's a support without conditions, which right. never happens in life. I don't support my kids without conditions. You know, if they fuck up, I will <laughs> tell them you did wrong. So this unconditional support for what most of the world see as a genocidal state also means that for me, we are leaving a crisis of democracy in general. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's the, it's also the wording, right? It's always the way that they actually word it. If you always look, It's always Israelis first and then, you know, Palestinian lives. And it's Israelis and then Palestinian humanitarian crisis. Israelis and then, you know, Palestinian, uh, they need to have some food and some water. That's always the way that it's positioned. Is this a, a crisis? Yes, absolutely. Look, one of the issues has been that the, the reason that people have such a hard time accepting what Israel is doing is because they've they've bought into this myth that somehow Israel's institutions are going to correct its course, right? That um, that there because there's a Supreme Court, um, because there they think there's a free press, that somehow these institutions are going to you know change things and they'll correct course. The problem is is that they actually don't know Israel. Israel's courts are a reflection of its society. All courts are, um, but but Israel's in particular, especially when you have settlers who are sitting on the court. Israel's media is not only a reflection of its society; it's a parrot, it's a mouthpiece for the government, 
And when you see that there's no very little critical reporting on what's happening, the very little critical reporting that's happening gets pushed up and, and shown as somehow being like, look, oh, the Israeli reports can can examine um, the truth about what happened. But yet it's these same Israeli outlets, these same few reports are used as cover to provide just the craziest analysis about why genocide is okay, why assassinations are okay, and so on. So for example, while there, there, we people are all, always talking about Haaretz and some of the great reporting that comes from Haaretz, at the same time you see that Haaretz, one of the headlines has been, why hasn't all of the Hamas, why haven't all the Hamas leaders been assassinated yet? As though assassination is okay and legal. And, and so the, the problem when it comes to this idea of democracy is that the, the world be, believes that Israel is a democracy. I know it's not. You know it's not. Anybody who's lived here knows that it's not. But because they think that it's a democracy, um, they're willing to somehow think that the institutions will sort things out. You know, just the, the, a couple of weeks ago, the body of um, the there was a court case involving the body of Walid Dhaka. Walid Dhaka was a Palestinian political prisoner who who's been in, in prison for uh, for for close to forty years. His sentence was over a couple of years ago, and the Israelis tacked on two additional years onto his sentence for the crime of having a phone. He had a rare form of of uh, leukemia, and his wife was not able to even speak to him after October the 7th, he only met his daughter once, his, his young little daughter. There, were, there was petition after petition to have him released from court. Each of the petitions denied. He died in April of this year. And all that the family is asking for is for him to be buried. And the, the much lauded court of Israel came out with a decision saying, no, no, um, it's okay to use him as a bargaining chip. A dead body can be used as a bargaining chip. And so when you see the way in which um, in the ways in which it's like to live in this society, then you understand that there's nothing democratic about it. And yet, because Israel has sold this false narrative of democracy, these democracies that are in the West continue to support Israel for that reason, and for other reasons as well. It's 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 um, it's such a stain on on society and on humanity. And I really think that people are going to look back and and hold their heads in shame for what Israel has been allowed to perp to commit and what they've allowed Israel to commit over the course of the past year. Israel's depravity at this point has no limits. Thanks, Jana. This is going to be my last question. But can such a society, I mean, can such a, count, a, a country that has been built, built on, on ethnic cleansing slash genocide, and that's, that since then has only sustained itself by more and more violence. At some point, it's got to crumble, don't you think? At some point, and we've seen in the last year the most horrific version of what Israel can do. At some point, it's got to self employ You know, it's not even for a person, you know, someone who all his life is based on hatred of somebody else. At some point, it's not sustainable, don't you think? It's already crumbling. It's already crumbling. We're seeing already that people are leaving the country. Um, we're already seeing that the economy has been downgraded, not once, but twice. We're already seeing that uh, it's very expensive to live here. October 7th shattered the myth that Israelis had that somehow they could be um, safe and secure while Palestinians are not safe or secure or free. And that was a, a, a very severe blow to them. At the same time, they're also now realizing that, that their only future is to constantly be living by the sword and to be living in a state of constant war. And for many people, that's just something that they just don't want to live under. It's not for love of Palestinians, but even for their own lives. They're seeing this as not something that is healthy. 
um, because it's not healthy. And the only way that Israel can sustain itself is through tons of, of support from the United States and through continually living by the sword. This, this somehow this, this fixation that they have that, um, that, you know, the only way that they can, that, that we should live is, is to feel this level of insecurity. It's, it's crumbling. And we already see that so much of the state is turning into itself, not only with people leaving, but with the disputes that they're having over whether the ultra-Orthodox are, um, should be going to the army, to things like, um, uh, people who are ref are slowly refusing to to go to the army uh, because the because the government is not doing anything to better conditions for them, it's slowly crumbling, and and it's 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 not it, it's not sustainable in the end, and I think that people are realizing this now. Thank you, as always, Jana. Thank you, thank you, Prank. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I hope we speak in better time.